Okay, I think we're live now. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Theology on Tap. Tonight, uh, we're going virtual, and uh, really excited to have uh, my friend, author, theologian, uh, doc, my doctoral supervisor, uh, Thomas J. Ord, here with us tonight. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for the opportunity for this uh, discussion, Jason. Yeah, you've been uh, you've been a busy man the last few months, multiple book releases, and you're all over the map, so... Tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been up to the last couple of months. I mean, we're here tonight to talk about this particular book, but uh, what else have you been up to the last little while? Yeah, well, there's a couple of collections of essays that were also published in the last month. Uh, one collection, uh, written short essays written by psychologists, therapists, and counselors under the title, Love Does Not Control. And the uh, basic notion is taking some of my work that says, you know, God's love is uncontrolling, and then asking the question, well, if we're supposed to imitate this uncontrolling God as therapists, counselors, then what does that look like? So that book came out about two months ago. And then uh, the book we're going to talk about tonight came out maybe three month, three weeks ago. And two weeks ago, a book came out called Why the Church of the Nazarene Should Be Fully LGBTQ Plus Affirming. I'm a part of a denomination, in fact, an ordained elder called the Church of the Nazarene, and we have a fairly traditional stance on uh, human sexuality issues. And this is a big book, almost 500 pages of 90 plus essays arguing for a change in the denomination. Mm. Yeah, I've been reading some of those essays. They're both important and somewhat heart-wrenching to read some of those stories. So yes. I pre appreciate you putting that out. Yeah. But the book we want to uh, dig into tonight is uh, this book here. It's called The Death of Omnip Omnipotence and Birth of Amnipotence. And that might be a new word for some, and you'll unpack that a little bit later this evening. But uh, I find it interesting, those of us familiar with you and your writing, this is probably the first book of yours I've encountered where the word love isn't well, it's kind of hidden in plain sight, but it isn't on <laughs> the cover. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll get to that. It's kind of buried in the title. But that's really been, that's one thing that initially drew me to your work was everything you write about is rooted in love and the core attribute of God being love and then building your theology and how God relates to the world out from there. And so this book is a gift. I've read it. I've referred it to many others. I thought it would be worthy of a conversation tonight. Thanks. Uh, slightly controversial. You're no stranger to controversy. One of your last books was called simply God Can't, uh, which I recommend as well. But uh, based, don't judge a book by its cover if the, <laughs> the title seems uh, a little bit controversial. So what we'll do tonight uh, is we'll spend some time. I'll pass it over to you to do some teaching, unpacking the content of the book. Uh, we'll have a little bit of, of Q&A via the chat on the YouTube stream as well. If people are watching, want to chime in and we'll just uh, basically unpack the contents of this book. I'm just going to read the back cover of the book and then we'll get started. And maybe before you get into the content, Tom, you can just tell us a little bit about yourself. I know it's always hard to, in five to seven minutes to share a little bit about your faith journey, maybe some of your personal passions and hobbies, uh, just kind of maybe familiarize yourself with uh, those listening tonight. So let me read the back cover of the book first. It says, Omnipotence is not born of scripture. Chapter one, you're going to unpack. It dies a death of a thousand qualifications. That's chapter two in a nutshell. Uh, evil buries omnipotence six feet under. Chapter three. But, and this is an important but, God is not dead. God is omnipotent. And so we're going to unpack those four statements. But before we get there, Tom, who is Thomas J. Ward? Tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> well, I grew up in a little farming community in Washington State. I uh, was a very active member of a little church that my parents were leaders in uh, for their entire life. And I was a kind of kid who gave my heart to Jesus many times growing up. By the time I got in high school and college, I was a, a strong evangelist, was a part of Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, you know, went to camps, was one of those people who walked around with their Bible in their hand. And uh, then near the end of my college career, I uh, took a course in philosophy of religion, 
And the questions in that course really kind of, I, I'd been wrestling with them for years, actually, but that course allowed me to face those questions head on. Mm. And um, for the sake of intellectual honesty, I decided I couldn't believe God existed anymore. I remember one evening coming to pick up my girlfriend, who's now my wife, <laughs> her getting into the car and me looking at her and saying, I just don't believe in God anymore. Um, I was an atheist agnostic for uh, not a long period of time. I kept at the quest of trying to make sense of life and whether or not it made sense to believe in God. And I came back to belief in God primarily uh, based on two issues. One, my search for meaning in life. I, I realized I couldn't have something like ultimate meaning if there wasn't a ground for ultimate meaning. And the second one I think we're going to get into tonight, uh, I had these deep intuitions about love, that I ought to be a loving person, that in some sense love was the answer. And I couldn't make good sense of that, those deep feelings or that intuitions about love if there wasn't the source of love that most people call God. And so beginning from those kind of kind of tearing out everything and starting all over, I've kind of built up a theology drawing from scripture, experience, science, arts, etc. I'm now an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene. I uh, direct a doctoral program, as you mentioned earlier, at Northwind Theological Seminary. I've taught it in um, undergraduate and graduate institutions for the last 20 years. Oh, I should say, I, I, for, I said all that without talking about my family. I'm married, have three daughters, two grandchildren, and I'm also a photographer and, of course, a, a writer. And a hiker. And a hiker. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Got to get that in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you you share some of your, your hiking photos, too, on your websites and your social media pages. So I encourage people to track along, not just for the robust theological conversations, but for... Uh, the beautiful pictures. I mean, probably this picture behind you, this is probably one you took, I'm guessing. It right? is. Yes, it is. Yeah, I forgot which one I was using. Yeah, that's uh, in an area that I actually do a lot of hiking in called the Owyhees, which is a section of Idaho, Oregon, California, and Nevada. A lot of wide open country. Beautiful. We got a massive rainstorm here today. We're getting our heavy dose of the April showers here, but the snow was gone finally. So, uh, okay, good. It's cause for joy. <laughs> All right, well, let's get let's get into the conversation. I'm just going to turn it over to you, Tom, and just take as much time as you want to let us know, A, why is omnipotence not born of Scripture? Why does it die a thousand deaths of, based on the qualifications? And why the problem of evil buries omnipotence six feet under? Maybe what? Maybe just start by defining what is the traditional definition of omnipotence. That's probably a good place to start. Yeah, and actually that's kind of a... Um... A slippery question right at the get-go. What does it mean to say God is omnipotent? Because most people will say God is omnipotent, but aren't really careful about what they mean. And so early on in this book, I point to three basic ways of thinking about omnipotence that I'm going to reject in the book. One idea says that God exerts all the power in the universe. God controls everything because God does everything. The second idea says that God could do anything. So anything is possible for this God. And the third one says that God has the capacity to control anyone or anything, any situation. That third one, people who believe that will often say God doesn't always control, but God could, if God wanted to, control whatever's happening. And so omnipotence, as I'm going to use it tonight, involves all three of those ideas. You can reject one and accept others, but um, I'm going to cover all three. And, uh, you know, most people who've been around uh, Christianity or Islam or even Judaism know that God has been called omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty, uh, sovereign, all these kinds of words to talk about God's power. And one of the surprising things that I reveal in the very first chapter is that this word omnipotent and its meaning are not found in the Christian scriptures. Um, now, if you look carefully at most English Bibles, you won't find the actual word omnipotent in there, but you will find the word almighty. And that word almighty is used in the Hebrew scriptures, what most Christians call the Old Testament. 
as a translation of two words. It first appears as a translation of the word Shaddai, as in El Shaddai, God the Almighty. Um, that word, however, is a mistranslation. Shaddai means something like breasts or mountains. So the idea is, if you look at the context in which Shaddai appears in most, in most cases, uh, this is some sort of fertility kind of idea that God is the breasted one who provides nourishment to life and creation. Sometimes Shaddai, though, is kind of more of a refuge, mountain kind of a thing, a protection. But neither one of those mean almighty or omnipotent. The second word that you'll read as translated almighty in the Hebrew scriptures is the word Sabaoth. And that one is often preceded by a variety of Jewish words or Hebrew words for God. But that word literally means hosts or councils or army or a group. And so that was mistranslated as well. Instead of the Lord of hosts or God of the council, it got translated, or at least it will be translated in the Bibles most of you are reading, as almighty. So the question, you know, is how did this come about? <laughs> how did these translations right. occur? <laughs> and the answer is that in the 3rd and 4th century BCE, uh, some Jewish scholars who are Greek-speaking wanted to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And so when they're picking these Greek words, they pick a word that is pentocrater, pento meaning all, crater meaning something like holding. So God is all holding. Again, not quite omnipotent or almighty, but at least you got the all word in there. <laughs> um, sure. And that word is used to describe Sabaoth and El Shaddai, two words that don't really mean all holding, but there they are. And then when we get to the New Testament, if you read the New Testament carefully, it, you rarely see the word almighty, but Pantocrator, translated as almighty, occurs 10 times, nine of them in Revelation and once um, in which the Apostle Paul is using it, quoting the Septuagint, actually. Um, and so I look at all of those instances and say, none of those explicitly says God is controlling or omnipotent or anything like that. Sounds like we got some background noise. I don't know if folks are listening. Is that you, Jason, or somebody else maybe? Are you you hearing some? Oh, you got it? Okay. <laughs> I'm hearing some background. Is that, I don't think that's on my side of things. I think we should be good now. Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so the basic point of that part, part of the chapter is that the Greek and the Hebrew words that we read as almighty in our Bibles are mistranslations. They don't mean almighty. They don't mean omnipotent. Now, one could say, well, just because the actual words almighty that are trans should be translated almighty or omnipotent aren't in the Bible, the meaning could still be in the Bible. So in this last half of that chapter, I look at the three meanings. God exerts all power. God can do anything. And God controls others and situations. Well, the first one, God exerts all the power, just doesn't make sense. I mean, there's obviously people, creatures are exerting power in the Bible. In fact, sometimes power that's sinful, and surely God doesn't want sin. So it, it makes no sense to say God is absolutely controlling everything all the time by exerting all the power. But there's been some pretty important Christians in, in history who've tried to make that argument. The second one is more interesting. Can God do all things or anything? Now, there are some passages, including in the New Testament, that says things like, you know, with this, this is impossible for humans, but everything is possible for God. And I look at those and then contrast them with multiple statements in the scripture that says things like, God can't tell a lie. God can't grow tired. God can't uh, be tempted. God can't deny himself. And then stories about the Lord not being able to do things. And say, look, if you look at scripture, you've got some texts that say there's things that God can't do. So maybe we ought to use those and try to make sense of those ones that say God can do anything. And my proposal there is that God is always able to offer salvation in some sense. So that's never uh, impossible for God. But that doesn't mean that God can literally do anything. We'll come back to that question, though. And then the third one is probably the most controversial. 
because it says the third view of omnipotence says that God can control people or creation. And here, I think lots of people, including scholars, have come to the Bible and read it through the glasses that says God can do anything. And they've read stories and things and then said, oh, well, obviously, since God can do anything and God is in control, in that situation, God must have controlled to do a miracle, to part the Red Sea, to uh, get the, the uh, people of Israel out of Egypt or whatever. And I say that if we look at the text carefully, it never says God alone did something and there was no creaturely contribution. So even the meaning of omnipotence as, you know, controlling creation or creatures, even the meaning is not in the Bible. So that's chapter one. <laughs> chapter two moves from scripture to philosophy. And it's kind of addressing, getting back to that question, can God do anything? Um, I start by talking about a philosophy class I had as a university student in which the professor asked the question, can God make a rock so big that even God can't lift it? And this is a sort of intellectual conundrum, a paradox. Um, and it's been taken very seriously by scholars throughout the centuries and today, trying to wrestle through this. And I use that as a springboard to start to list all the things that God can't do, according to both conservative and progressive thinkers. Things like God can't make one plus one equal 367. God can't make a round square. God can't make a married bachelor. God can't uh, you know, do things that are illogical. But then there's a whole set of questions about things God can't do because they go against God's nature. So if God is omnipresent, God can't be absent somewhere. God can't decide, I'm not going to be in Edmonton. Uh, God, if God's omnipresent, God's also in Edmonton. Or uh, you know, can God stop existing? Nearly every single theologian in history has said, even the most conservative has said, nope, God necessarily exists. That's something God can't do. And I start listing all of these examples of things God can't do because to do them, God wouldn't be God. God would deny himself to use the, the, the biblical passage. Then I move into questions of chance and free will. If God gives freedom, then God can't control free creatures. Now, not everybody thinks God gives freedom, but a whole lot of people do. And if you're one of those people, then at least when God is giving the freedom, then God can't control the creatures who are free. Um, and I talk about issues related to science and evolution. I mean, I've just, in this chapter, time after time after time, I'm saying things God can't do because when I get to the end, I say omnipotence dies a death of a thousand qualifications. In other words, people say God is omnipotent, but then they have to qualify it over and over and over and over again. I think, though, the part of this chapter that I enjoyed writing the most and the part that I think will be most interesting even to scholars who, you know, uh, spend a lot of time with these issues it's the part in which I talk about God being a universal spirit without a divine body. If God is truly a universal spirit, like Jesus says, God doesn't actually have hands to pick up the rocks. God doesn't have teeth to chew bubble gum. God doesn't have an arm to do arm wrestling. There's all kinds of things that you and I can do that God can't do because God doesn't have a localized body. Now, I think God can call upon you and me to use our bodies, but if we have genuine free will, we can say no to God. So even if we say we are God's hands and feet, which I've got no problem saying as long as we're talking metaphorically, even if we say that, we have to say we're only God's hands and feet insofar as we freely cooperate with God. And I think that has huge implications for talking about God's power and what ends up being chapter three. Chapter three is taking on a question I've addressed in some other books, but doing it in a different way than I have previously. It's saying, uh, look, we all know that one, well, maybe we don't all know, but most of us know that the number one question for people who believe in God and the number one reason those people who don't believe in God say they can't believe in God is the questions of suffering and evil. 
if there's a truly loving God who's really powerful and loving, wouldn't this God prevent or stop the genuine evils of the world? Now, if you think God is omnipotent, then you ought to think God has the ability to do that. And if you think that, then you have to wonder why God doesn't love consistently, because obviously genuine evils occur that make the world worse than it might have been. Now, what most Christians have done, including the, some of the most brilliant, they've said they've appealed to mystery. They've said, on this question, God's ways are not our ways. You know, who are we to know the mind of God? And um, I think that's um, that's not playing fair. <laughs> I'm not saying I've got God figured out. I've got a lot to learn. I, I, there's all kinds of mystery in that sense. But to decide you're not going to rethink your view of God because you argue yourself into a corner on the problem of evil, I don't think that's a wise move. So what I do at the conclusion of that chapter is give six uh, issues that taken together can actually solve the problem of evil, not just give kind of a defense like, well, you can still be a smart person and not you know, believe in an omnipotent God, but these six ideas solve the problem of evil. And by that, I mean, if we take them together, we can actually give a real reason why there's evil in the world, and yet God is loving and powerful. But every one of those six rejects omnipotence. It says God simply can't control anyone or anything. So the first one says that God, uh, his love is uncontrolling by definition. And so God inherently can't control because God is a loving God. The second one says God feels or empathizes with those who suffer. So God is a fellow sufferer who understands. And that's a very common view today, but not a common view in Christian history. So I pick on Augustine again in that section. Third one says, God does want to heal when we're injured, but God can't single-handedly heal. God has to have some kind of cooperation by ourselves, by uh, communities, by creation, or the inanimate conditions of creation have to be conducive for that healing. The fourth one says God works with us in creation to try to squeeze something good out of the bad God didn't want, but God's not, you know, allowing or sending bad things to somehow improve our character. God's working with the bad with us in creation to try to bring something beautiful from it. The fifth idea says that we are called to work with God in overcoming evil in our lives and the world. And the final uh, uh, so part of the solution says that we need to rethink what it means for God to create the universe in the beginning. I think God is creator, but I don't think God created the universe out of absolutely nothing. And if you do, then all these issues of God's power and omnipotence come right back at you. So what if we actually went with the biblical <laughs> view of God as creator, which always seems to have creation playing some role, and then we laid out a doctrine of creation or a doctrine of God as creator. And I think we can do that and not have an omnipotent God. So those are the first three chapters. Hopefully you get an idea of what I'm trying to argue there. Should we stop here and see what folks have to say? Yeah, that's, that's a really good, concise overview, Tom, of the first three chapters of the book. And I mean, it, it's concise. It, this is not like an 800 page uh, <laughs> it's taking some heavy, important ideas and bringing it down where it's accessible. And that's what I appreciate about most of your books, Tom. Thank and you. so uh, I just want to, if, if this book is piquing people's interest, check it out, pick it up. Uh, it's not a difficult read, but it's profound. It's clearly laid out. I appreciate you leading with scripture engagement because I think you mentioned glasses and reading scripture through a certain lens and mine are in for repairs right now. So things are a little blurry for me tonight. Uh, <laughs> But that, that's been my experience, you know, wearing that particular lens and coming to Scripture. But I've, having read some of your books and then reading Scripture with new lenses, it does make sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I, I'd be curious to know in your journey, when did things first shift with your lenses? Because I'm sure, like me, there was a time in your life where God was almighty, God was all-powerful. I don't know if I've ever asked you this or had this talk in conversation with you what was there a catalytic moment or a series of events where you sort of changed your lenses 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was a gradual process. There was a time though, when I was in college, when I had eight people who were pretty close to me, family members, classmates, parents of uh, friends who died in that one year. And uh, so I went to a lot of funerals. I thought a lot about death, thought about, a lot about whether or not God was in control. Um, but I think the biblical, you know, I was, I'm glad you asked me this question because I was thinking about this recently. Um, there was a time, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, when I was convinced that God couldn't control. So I had given up on omnipotence. But I still thought the Bible portrayed God as a controlling God. Right. And I had come to a place where I was like, okay, if I have to choose between a loving God who's not responsible for evil or the God of the Bible who sometimes seems to be responsible for evil, I'm actually going to go against the Bible. So I thought I had to give up at least some portions of scripture to embrace this God. And then as I started looking more carefully at scripture and, and as this book suggests, it turns out I don't have to give up the Bible. It turns out that there have been some massive mistranslations. And as you mentioned, I've come to the text thinking the authors must have had in mind an omnipotent God, when in fact, there's no reason for me to think that's the case. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned coming to the text and seeing it, not having to give up the Bible, but just seeing it in new light. So let me just pick three particular examples or stories of traditional miracles. How would you explain these biblical passages viewed through the lens of God as uncontrolling love? So let's take the parting of the Red Sea is one you cited. Let's go to the New Testament. How about uh, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the multitude? and the big one, the resurrection story. How do we, how do we view these stories and, and many others, traditional miracle stories through the lens of uncontrolling love, not God unilaterally controlling? Yeah. So first, let me make a negative claim, and then we'll take each one individually. The negative claim is none of those events explicitly say God alone brought about the results and there was no creature to contribution. Now, I'm not saying they all explicitly talk about how creation cooperated with God. I'm just making the more general claim. And this is important. Um, I, this afternoon, I was watching Golden State beat the Sacramento Kings. What a game. Uh, yes. <laughs> Steph Curry went off for 50 points. Now, I suspect tomorrow in San Francisco, there'll be a headline that says something like, Steph Curry pushes the, the, um, the um, Warriors on to the next round. Now, will that statement be true? Is it the case that Steph Curry pushed the Warriors on to the next round? Sure, in one sense, I mean, 50 points. If he hadn't had that great game, they probably wouldn't have won. Who knows? But unlikely. But if you think Steph Curry was the only player on the court today, you don't know basketball. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Um, so the statement can be true. Steph Curry pushed the Warriors on to the next round. And yet it also be true, Steph Curry needed cooperation from the other players and the coaches and other factors to make that a reality. Now let's use that in scripture. When it says God parts the Red Sea, I don't know if it actually ever says it that explicitly, but let's just say the, the biblical passages say that. Does that mean that God alone made that happen? Or could God use other factors and forces in that have some sort of cooperation or uh, happenstance. And in that case, lots of biblical scholars have noted that in the parting of the Red Sea, that's not the only time the Red Sea is parted in history. In fact, uh, strong winds have oftentimes dried out areas of the sea for uh, portions of time before the waters came back. So um, does that mean we explain the parting of the Red Sea entirely by nature and say God had nothing to do with it? No, I think we can both believe God is acting and calling Moses and the people to go through the water at the right time, but also God is pretty good at predicting weather patterns and sees when winds are coming up. So that's an example of how we can see God is working with inanimate creation in such a way that God alone is not making things happen. Uh, there's some kind of creaturely uh, con the creation is conducive to the kind of miracles that we see in that moment. The feeding of the 5,000 is a lot harder for me. 
I tend to think, like a lot of biblical scholars, that's a, a pedagogical uh, story that probably didn't actually happen. But if I had to really sort of lay down you know, my cards here, not my cards, if I had to really take my, my scheme and apply it, I would say, okay, in some way, there is a, 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 this splitting up of the bread ends up feeding people. I, I obviously don't have a great theory on how that could happen. But the question would be, does God alone make that happen? Or does there have to be the elements of the fish and bread to make it happen? Does there have to be the elements of the, of the disciples handing these things out? Seems like the story requires those actors and factors at play. So my personal approach to that one is to say it probably didn't happen. Uh, there's actually two stories and one of them are 5,000 and another is 3,000, I think. But anyway, um, I think it probably is a way of talking about God provides. The resurrection of Jesus, though, it may seem like that's the most difficult one for me, but I actually think it's the easiest one for me because there's an actual body there. And um, we know of other people coming back to life. Plus, the accounts of Jesus post-resurrection are of Jesus in a very different kind of body. And um, so I don't think we have to necessarily think it's the exact same body that comes out of the grave that went in. In fact, that seems to be what the Apostle Paul believes, that this is some kind of a spiritual body. We're raised immortal to use his language. So great questions. That's how I would try to address each of them. No, very good. And yeah, I think the feeding story, the feeding of the multitude, there is a pedagogical component to it. I mean, when I when I teach on that story, it's it's the young boy is cooperating, right? He's responding to God's yeah. promptings in the story, right? Regardless of how sometimes we can miss the forest for the trees in some of these stories and miss the bigger picture. So I appreciate you going there. Um, okay, I got a, a couple of comments here in the chat. Uh, my friend Kathleen uh, makes a comment here and a bit of a question. She says, it seems that St. Teresa of Avila agrees Christ has no body on earth but yours. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Uh, so just following up on your God is a spirit without a localized body comment. And then she asks this question, at least to the degree that we respond from our freedom with a willingness to be used by God. And I guess that certainly relates to the problem of evil. It's not that God's on the hook. It's maybe the degree to which creation is responding or not responding uh, is directly correlative to the amount of evil and suffering in the world. Do you want to comment on, on that comment or question? Yeah, Tom? I love that. I love that Teresa of Avila quote. I like it a lot. And I like the way uh, you're the, the person uh, interpreted that as our cooperation with God. Um, and even when we cooperate with God, there may be limitations on what's available. If I'm, for instance, out hiking in the Idaho wilderness all alone, and I, a rock falls on my leg and I'm stuck there, uh, I can try to cooperate with God the very most I can, but I might not be able to get out of that situation. And there might not be anybody else around to, you know, know that I'm there to cooperate with God. So um, I'm all on board with cooperating with God, but I don't, I, and I don't think this person meant this, but I just want to add in, that doesn't mean then that anything is possible. There's still some restrictions and limitations that reality gives us. Very good. Uh, another comment in the chat from Lon uh, related to the, the feeding story we discussed. People had brought along food and in a spirit of unity and with the boys example, they all began to share. So there is a possibility that uh, the example of the young boy led to those sharing what little they had and people were fed in mass. So lots of different ways to handle that story. Um, all right, well, let's let's continue on, Tom, because, I mean, people might think you're totally dismantling, you're deconstructing omnipotence, and now what do we do, right? God is yeah. no longer almighty. Is God impotent? What God can do? I mean, you've written a book called God Can't. You're following up with this book, but you don't land the plane there. You write the final chapter about this new word, the birth of omnipotence. And so uh, what can God do? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the, the reason I really wanted to uh, write this chapter, because, you know, people read God Can't, and many people found it helpful because they no longer had to blame God for either causing their suffering or allowing their suffering, because this God can't uh, control anyone or anything, because this God loves everyone and everything. But they had lots of questions, like, is this God just a wimp? Is this God watching from the sidelines of life? 
Is this God impotent to use that word you mentioned? Uh, and even some really f- important scholars, um, some of you might know a guy named Bill Craig, William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig and I were at a conference one time, maybe four or five years ago. This must have been about four years ago. And uh, he was criticizing my view. And he thought I was advocating deism, which is the idea that there is a God who created the universe long ago, but now kind of watches from a distance like Bette Midler's God. And uh, he obviously had not read my work carefully, but I wanted to write this chapter to lay out a view of God's power that avoids impotence and omnipotence. And so this new word, amipotence, A-M-I is the Latin prefix for love and potence for power or influence, is to say, what if we think about God's power as the power of love? Now, I'm not the first to make that kind of a move, but I wanted to really get nitty gritty and talk about what that means. And so I said it more specifically. I said, what if God's power is the power of uncontrolling love? And this love is never able to coerce in the sense of controlling creatures or creation, but is the most powerful force in the universe. And I'm not saying that metaphorically. I'm saying that literally. God is an omnipresent, loving presence who influences absolutely everything from the quarks to the quasars, all through reality at all times and places, but never in a controlling kind of way. Now, what would that look like? What would this omnipotence, this uncontrolling power of love look like? Well, I try to get a uh, look at what it might mean to say God is a universal spirit and use the language of scripture and bring in some philosophical notions to say, if this God is a spirit who is influencing all things at all places, and this spirit is not something we can see with our eyes or even perceive with our five senses, but we can access this through what I call non-sensory perception or what the um, biblical writers will call a still small voice or intuition or lots of other kinds of phrases like that. Then we see God is really present, really powerful and active, but the effectiveness of God's power hinges upon you and me and all of creation cooperating with God. God can act and this action can be a call toward love, But if you and I don't cooperate, then God's purposes are not fulfilled. I go back then to the scriptures and say, if we have this notion of an omnipotent God, who is a universal loving spirit, active at all times and all places, always calling, always empowering and inspiring, can we make sense of the biblical witness? And I think we can even better than thinking God is omnipotent because we can say all the positive, the miracles that we mentioned earlier, all those can really happen because God is active and working and then creation is responding. And then all of the things that are horrible in scripture, we don't have to say, well, it must be a part of God's plan for the people to die or, you know, um, all those laments when the people are saying, you know, why isn't God coming to rescue us? How long do we going to have to stay in this situation? We don't have to think, well, God could have rescued, but just sitting there saying, you know, i got to punish you a little longer or whatever. Uh, we can say God was really trying and active, but either there wasn't a cooperation Uh, necessary, or the uh, conditions of creation were not conducive to that rescuing. So that's how I try to come back to have a powerful God who's not culpable for for evil, but is still the creator and redeemer of the universe. Very good. Very good. I got another question in the chat. Someone's still lingering on the, the concept of miracles, more what we might see as modern day miracles. And the question is, in light of limitations, be they in creation or our own, if God is not almighty in the traditional sense, are all modern day miracles simply coincidences? Hmm. I don't think so. Maybe some are. And so I actually believe in chance. And I think there can be good luck and bad luck. So in that sense, since it would be a good coincidence, but a lot of miracles are because people cooperate or creatures. I mean, I think other creatures can cooperate with God too, not just humans. Take the uh, coming down of the Berlin Wall. I think that's a miracle, a modern day miracle. I don't think it was chance. I think there were lots of individuals cooperating with God to see that become a reality. 
um, healings today. I think the body can cooperate with God or fail to cooperate with God. So, um, no, it's not all chance, but I also think there's sometimes we just get lucky. Now, uh, I've got a thought. I, as you're tracking along, um, I've seen in my own life, and we've both been in Christian church circles for many years, sometimes we can see the worst of the church in victim blaming. And uh, I think one potential negative byproduct of this view, if, if taken poorly or in immature fashion, is that we start blaming victims, right? Well, God yeah. didn't cause your pain and suffering, so you must be the one at fault. How, how can we avoid letting the pendulum swim for swing too far to one extreme? Like not, we're not indicting God now, but now we're victim blaming and shaming. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I've heard that a lot. You know, the reason you're not over your cancer is you're not praying hard enough. You're not trusting God with your, your body or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't want to do the blame, blame the get victim. And my approach to this thing is can avoid that problem by saying that we live in a matrix of causes and effects in our universe. And sometimes we as individuals can consciously be saying yes to God, but our bodies, those in our surroundings can be saying no to God. And because we live in an interrelated universe, the decisions of others can affect us negatively, even when we are cooperating to the very best that we can. So the person who's praying to get over cancer can be consciously uh, following and, and trying to do everything possible, following whatever they think God is calling them to do, or the physicians, and yet the cells in their body be cancerous because either the, to the capacity they have to cooperate with God, they're not cooperating, or in the instances in which there's no real cooperation there, the inanimate conditions of their body aren't conducive for overcoming that cancer. Mm -hmm. This actually gets to a really important issue that I'm guessing may be new to some of the people who are watching or listening to this. Um, and that's this question of um, how far down of complexity does agency and responsiveness go? Most people that was my say, next question. Was it? Okay, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most people got no problem saying humans can respond to God and, you know, maybe Balaam's ass and other complex creatures. But, you know, can mice respond to God? Can worms respond to God? What about cells? What about quarks? Um, I find most uh, plausible a view of reality that says there's something like agency in varying degrees, even down to the smallest uh, levels of reality. I'm not saying that worms are conscious. Maybe they are, but I kind of doubt it. I really doubt cells are conscious. But I do think that even cells have the capacity to respond to their environment. I mean, I think that's very widely thought uh, to be true in the medical sciences, that our bodies do respond to stimuli, chemicals, medicines, whatever. So um, this view is sometimes called panpsychism or panexperientialism. I call it material mental monism. But it's, you know, to use uh, some movie examples, it's like thinking that reality is more like um, more like uh, Mother Willow in Pocahontas, that old cartoon or movie uh, animated thing, or like, um, oh, what's the... What's the recent movie? Um, oh, it's escaping me. Or maybe I'll give another example. The Ents in Lord of the Rings, you know, the trees right. that walk through the forest. Um, anyway, to think about more of an animated world uh, as being true rather than the world being more like, uh, you know, a, a machine. I don't think that's like probably right. That's good. I got, I got some more comments coming in the chat Great. here. I just want to relay these. So just again, someone processing out loud, I want to get your comments on this. Um, could it be suggested with any merit that this distinction of the omnipotence and omnipotence of God might be revealed or articulated first in the Ab Abram and God's call to God's people um, to bring blessings to the nation and flourishing to all people and then rearticulated by the prophets and then Jesus. So just sort of affirming this theme of call and response. Would this also speak to the consequences of our interconnectedness, either our suffering or our flourishing? Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. yeah. 
I think, you know, I'm the one who invented the word omnipotence, but the idea, I think, is throughout Scripture. Sure. I'd like to say every single passage unequivocally portrays God as loving, but I've read the Bible and I know that's not the case. I think it fits the general witness and the witness of Jesus, but there are some passages that portray God as unloving, at least as I read them. And I think, um, you know, I used to look at those passages and try to think, well, maybe that love, that's love and from God's perspective and not ours. But yeah. today I don't do that anymore. I just say, you know, sometimes the biblical writers simply got God wrong. Now, I know that makes some people uncomfortable, but uh, that's the best way I can make sense of the diverse witness of Scripture. So, well, um, yeah, go ahead. Just let me jump. That that fits well with the whole understanding. I mean, God, if God's not omnipotent, God's not micromanaging the text of Scripture, that's right? Exactly. God's right. influencing and inspiring, but giving God's, you know, as I think Pete N says it, you know, God lets his children write the story, right? Yes. And so, much like we do, we sometimes we project our experiences or our cultural realities upon God. And uh, what I like to do when I teach on Scripture and how to understand Scripture is some passages serve as windows of God's grace and love, but some other passages serve as mirrors to, you know, the stain of who sin and evil in the human yeah. heart, who we are. They can both be have some pedagogical value, um, but the pictures that portray God as loving sort of trump the other ones, I think. Yeah, that's powerful. I totally agree. And this is another reason why we need to give up omnipotence. Because if God has the kind of power to make sure we have a perfectly inerrant scripture and the scripture we have got errors, then, you know, either God's allowing the errors, which seems kind of weird if you think scripture is supposed to help us live life well and find salvation or uh, some, you know, some we're most people say, well, we just don't understand. We're not reading it correctly. And I, I think, of course, we can't know all things, but that's kind of a cop out. Um, I would disagree with Pete Inns just slightly, but I think this slight disagreement makes a difference. When Pete says God lets his children write the text, it sounds kind of like God could have given that text single-handedly or unilaterally, right. made sure right. it was error-free. I'd say something more like God has to, uh, or the people have to write the text. God can't guarantee an inerrant, infallible scripture. Um, that doesn't mean that you know, people don't have any intuitions about what God wants. I still think it's inspired, but that's different from being inerrant. Mm, very good. Very good. Yeah, I would agree with that nuance. A couple more comments in the chat here. Um, Lon says, what humans think of power, God does differently with love. We are continually nice. imagining this coercive move. God does it through loving, sacrifice, mercy, peace, etc. Mm -hmm. And another comment here, God may be continuing trying to help us understand more clearly, and we are required to respond. There's something to be said about God's enduring love, his patience. And maybe that's a good segue to talk a little bit about eschatology, because um, how do you understand eschatology if you give up omnipotence? What about life beyond the grave? I know you've written about this in some of your other books, but maybe just give us a little taste and, and where maybe if people want to read more of your work, where they can get a sort of a fuller expression of your view of uh, the eschatology based on a God of uncontrolling love. Yeah, thanks for that question. Just a little insight. I originally had planned to put a section in this book on eschatology, but since I talked about it in some other books, I and I thought it was... I don't know, it just felt right not to include it in this book. So if folks are listening and would like to read that, uh, you can find it in several books of mine. Um, I think maybe I'll answer that question a little bit differently than I have maybe in some other situations. Uh, one of my more recent books was called Pluriform Love. And in that, I worked a lot with a Hebrew word that some of you may have heard called hesed or chesed. Um, and this is the word that most uh, translators will translate as steadfast love or covenantal love or loyal love. And it occurs a lot in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. And in fact, the line, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever is a repeated theme in the Psalms and other places. What if, what if we take that literally? What if this steadfast love is uncontrolling everlastingly. In other words, even at the beginning of our universe, God was acting in an uncontrolling way when creating 
instead of ab instead of out of absolutely nothing god was creating out of the chaos of a previous universe that god had created and what if in the eschaton in the afterlife god still is loving in an uncontrolling way the steadfast love literally endures forever into the future as well if that's the case then we need to rethink our usual views of the afterlife the usual views either have god sending some people to hell forever in some kind of omnipotent unilateral move or god deciding everybody goes to heaven but omnipotently sending us all into heaven even though we don't some people may not want to go there again an omni a move of omnipotence or if you're an annihilationist or what some people call conditionalist this god you know either actively or passively let some people stop existing and then make sure that the rest of the people go to heaven my proposal is to say if we think of god's steadfast love enduring forever and love is a calling an invitation to this healthy kind of relationship what if we then said the afterlife in continues in such a way that god always invites everyone capable of responding to say yes to god and this relentless love never ever 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 stops it doesn't ever come the case in which god says you know i've been working on jason for 497 years i've given him 8 billion chances and this last one is going to be his last if he doesn't say yes this time he double toothpicks for him or i'm going to annihilate him what if god never gives up on anybody now that doesn't guarantee universal reconciliation because we always have free will but the relentless love of god gives us the hope of relentless reconciliation because god might just quote wear us down in the sense that love might finally win because it is truly everlastingly relentless I love that. And for years, that's been my intuition, even before formally abandoning omnipotence, just this yeah. idea that you know, God's not going to coerce because love isn't coercive, but God, God's love is the most powerful force in the world. And my hope is that it will wear people down until eventually <laughs> all will capitulate, whether on this side yeah. of the grave or the next. It's not a guarantee, but it's a very real hope that we should work towards. And, you know, and there's real life implications for right if god is omnipotent then we need to look i mean the church needs to look very closely in the mirror at how we use the power and authority that we have been given right if god is not coercive i mean this is not just hypothetical theology this is very practical implications for how we live and operate in the body of christ uh through influence of love that imitates christ not through power and control and we've seen the worst of that throughout history with the church when the church is yeah. at its worst it's constantly misusing power and control going back to you know constantine and augustine and off we go right there were some dark days coming out of church history class and seminary <laughs> but the church is at its best when like saint Teresa says you know god has no body like ours and we have an opportunity and a privilege to use our literal voice and hands and feet to be an extension of god's uncontrolling love so Wonderful. Yeah, you, said it, you said it beautifully. I don't want to add anything to that, but I would like to add a little different angle because I forgot to mention this earlier. <laughs> in that chapter three, I actually do some political theology, something I've not done in other books. And I wrestle with the issue that um, when we think about leaders, whether they're political leaders like um, prime ministers or kings, queens, or even leaders like pastors or CEOs or something like that, um, if we think God is omnipotent, then we would easily come to the notion that any leader that's in charge, even the worst leaders, the dictators, the, the abusive, power-hungry people, God either put them in power or God allowed them to be where they're at. And neither one of those sounds very good, very loving. <laughs> but if we get rid of omnipotence, then we don't have to think that whoever's in charge is in charge because God put them there or allowed them to be there. And I think that's a much healthier view of the way we think about policies and politics. Very good. Uh, this is an interesting question. One I pondered myself in the chat. Uh, is there ever a time where God may step in to bring all things to completion 
Or does the kingdom come is ushered in to the degree we willingly allow God to work in and through us? You know, because in scripture, it seems to give some of those eschatological passages, 1 Corinthians 15, the end of Revelation seems to have this sort of sense of completion. Uh, how would you respond to that question? Yeah, um, I think there's lots of eschatologies in the scriptures. And so uh, I don't want to make the claim that mine fits every last passage. I think it fits some really nicely, others not so well. Um, but I gave up on believing that God would sometime kind of say, okay, I've been, I've been uncontrolling up till now, but I'm going to step in and control the situation and bring it all to some final conclusion. And the reason I've not liked that, well, there's a couple of them. One is it's not very consistent in thinking love is always uncontrolling because it says, well, I guess sometimes I guess you can come in and kick some butt, you know. Uh, but secondly, if God has the kind of power to do that sometime in the future, you'd think that God would want to use that power in the present, at least for the really horrible stuff, and yet some really, really horrible stuff happened. So both for the sake of consistency in thinking about God's love and power, and also for the sake of not blaming God for failing to prevent the genuine evils now, I have shied away from saying God can will one day step in and unilaterally, single-handedly, coercively bring all things to an end. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've got a question. and I'm, I think you've probably heard this question plenty. Let me just play devil's advocate for a moment. Because um, it, it, it seems that, you know, sometimes the most loving, like I'm a parent, you're a parent, sometimes the most loving thing we can do, especially with small children, is to exert some sort of force or control. Let's say I'm playing basketball with my little kids out in the driveway and the ball rolls on the road and there's a car coming at my, like, I literally grab them and force them out of the way. That's the, maybe the most loving thing I can do in the moment. What would you say of the objection that sometimes in our human experience, it seems that love uh, is at times controlling or should be controlling? How do you respond yeah. to that? Yeah, really great question. Um, this makes me then want to do two things. One, be a little clearer what I mean by the word control. And secondly, talk about the difference between you and me and God. So by control, I'm using that word in the sense of a philosophical uh, 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 definition of being a sufficient cause, being the only cause to make something happen. So in your example of grabbing the kid from the road, there's all kinds of other, excuse me, causes at play in that situation. Not, uh, so you're not literally controlling them by being the only cause. But what you are doing is using your hands to grab the kid before the truck hits it. And I think that's a loving thing to do. I think sometimes using our bodies to exert bodily impact upon others is a loving thing. Now, if we can do it and it's loving for us, then the question is, well, why doesn't God sometimes do that? And this gets me back to why it's so important for me to say God is a universal spirit without a literal divine body. That means that Jason can sometimes use his hands to grab kids out of the way of oncoming cars, but God doesn't literally have a divine hand to grab kids. Now, again, we can go back to Jason being God's hands and feet, and then we also have to say that Jason has free will, and so all those things come back in. But that's a really good question, and one I think uh, it prompted me about 20 years ago to say, I really am going to double down on the classic Christian view that God is an incorporeal or bodiless universal spirit, such that God can't do some things that embodied creatures like you and I can do. Very good. Yeah, and that's that's sort of a new idea for a lot. It seems counterintuitive to say we can do things that God can't, but when you take into consideration God has no body like ours and he is an incorporeal spirit, it makes perfect sense, right? That, yes. That yeah. things do really matter. Our free choices do really matter to God and to creation. That God influences us and we exert some influence on God and creation at the same time. It's a mutual relationship. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. I think the easiest way for people to get there is probably to say things like, ask the question, can God sin? And almost everybody has said, no, God can't sin. And then we say, well, you and I can sin, so we can do something God can't do. And that then gets us rolling to thinking about mm -hmm. what are the, who, what's God's like, the ways that God is like that's different than the way we are like. Mm, 
Very good. Now, how has the book been doing? Has it been well received? Yeah, very well been? received. I mean, you know, there's always some people who disagree, but uh, very good reviews, selling well on Amazon. And, you know, some of the more scholarly re reviews will take a while to come out because they go in journals and that's just a long process. But there's always already been some very positive uh, scholarly reviews. Fantastic. And I said from the outset that on the surface, this seems like the first book without love on the title, but we've learned a little bit of Latin tonight, Amipotence, the potency of love. So there it is. Hidden That's in right. Plain sight. You just you just couldn't do it. That's right. <laughs> well, as you, you put it eloquently earlier, for me, love is at the center of not only how I try to think about God, but even how I try to think about my life and reality. Um, for me, love is the ultimate intuitive clue to make sense of existence. Mm, very good. Yeah. And that's, that's, that seems to be my evangelistic starting point with people. It's just finding that common ground and seeing people's desire, the universal desire to love and to be loved. And why do we have that intuition? I mean, that for me, that's, that's, that's always the starting point of looking for common ground. Yeah, it's hard to go wrong starting with love. Now, there's obviously different ways of thinking about love and different definitions. And so you can get into details pretty quickly. But yeah, um, yeah, love is yeah. so important. Yeah. All right. I got, uh, oh, well, this is a good question. Uh, let's, let's address this one before we start winding down tonight. Uh, again, we're, we're in the eschatological framework here. A lot of questions. So what will happen? How will the transition into heaven being united with earth from an open and relational, uncontrolling love perspective? How will it look? Yeah, <laughs> People are really curious one. about this, Tom. That's yeah. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, it's lots of speculation here, right? So sure, of course. I don't want to pretend like I've got everything figured out. So I guess the way I try to answer that is to say, what happens when we in creation cooperate with God now? What happens? Well, there's a kind of flourishing, there's a kind of growth, there's a kind of uh, peace, well-being, shalom, um, and that looks different in different situations. I, I'm not one of these people who thinks that uh, all of existence will end up becoming one you know, bright shining light and all the differences will fade. I'm a person who thinks the differences will remain, but there's many different ways to express love and for love to flourish. And so, um, you know, whenever I see progress and love happening in this, in this life, in these moments, I think to myself, okay, what would be the extrapolation of that in the future? And, you know, my, 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 uh, my vision is somewhat limited because <laughs> I've only lived 50 some years and, uh, but it's going to be something like a kind of harmony in the midst of difference that, uh, is a reduction a drastic reduction in violence. Uh, there's probably still be chance events that will be, uh, hurtful. I'm not saying those will disappear, but even some of the chance events will, will, uh, diminish as creation, uh, I think, um, clicks along better. <laughs> I don't, don't know the right word. Uh, creation um, is the symbiotic relation of even at the biological level can be increased over time. And so the uh, chance events that are negative, I think, will also be reduced. Now, for you and me, I happen to believe in an afterlife. And I happen to believe that this life will be something like the continuation of our subjective experience beyond bodily death. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that all conflict will disappear after our bodies fade away. But there are some parts of my body that give me a lot of pain that I'm looking forward to not <laughs> having to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and yeah. some of the temptations that come along with the body also i won't have and also some of the the good things i'm not an anti-material anti-body person but yeah. um so that's the kind of way my mind goes when i think about the future yeah amen to new bodies i'm wearing a heart monitor tonight as we speak you, so. okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well there's something to be said too in scripture this idea of sort of a, a veil being taken away post-mortem so maybe yeah. we'll they'll be able to sort of see and experience god's love with a greater sense of clarity and less impediments of this world which yeah. might might help further the vision of the new heaven and the new earth coming to fruition right it gives there's us that lots yeah. yeah there's lots of biblical cl claims about us having increased knowledge 
Now, I don't think we'll be omniscient. I don't think that mm -hmm. once we die, we know absolutely everything. But, you know, but now we see as if looking through a darkened glass and then we'll see face to face. It sounds like an increased understanding of things. Yeah, that's a good way. To do it. Excellent. Well, I think those are most of the questions in the chat. So maybe we'll sort of wind things down there. But before we before we uh, wind down, Tom, maybe just take a couple moments. You've got two images on your screen here, one over your left shoulder, one over your right shoulder. So you can just talk about maybe a little bit about the Center for Open Theology and what's what's happening at Northwind Seminary. Great. Yeah, I direct a Center for Open and Relational Theology. Open and Relational Theology is a big umbrella under which lie lots of different ideas, movements, and people. Open means that the future is open, that God is moving into a future that's not predestined. And relational means that God is in interrelated uh, relationship with us and all of creation. Uh, and there's a bunch of people who like those general ideas and are working on all kinds of interesting details on what that might look like. And Jason is one of those people, as well as hundreds of others who have their uh, profiles on the center. If this is something you're interested in, uh, I'd love to put your profile. I'm talking to everybody who's listening and watching now. Uh, but the center promotes these kinds of ideas, conferences. Uh, and one of the things that it co-hosts is a, a doctoral program in open and relational theology, co-hosted by Northwind Theological Seminary. And Jason's also a part of that. I direct that program. It's a fully online thing in which I work one-on-one -on -one with people pursuing their doctoral degrees as they explore the big questions like we've been talking about tonight from an open and relational perspective. So if you're interested, uh, you can probably just Google those two words, Center for Open and Relational Theology or Northwind Theological Seminary, and you can find more information. Yeah, I think it's just C, the number four, ORT.com, Center for Open Relational Theology. Lots to explore there, lots of voices. I think more and more people around the world are embracing some of these ideas and yes. it's leading to greater flourishing. Um, yep. Very good. Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and the thoughtful questions and feedback tonight. Tom, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a busy hey. man. I appreciate you taking some time to hang out tonight. Thank and you. Thanks, man. For, this is thanks for this gift. Yeah. yeah, it's been a great discussion. I, I not only appreciate the opportunity, but also your good questions and the questions that were posed in the chat. Yeah, and I'm just dipping my toes in the uh, doctoral journey. So I'm looking forward to working with you over the next few years. So thanks for this book. To uh, would encourage our listeners to uh, pick up a copy. It's available on Amazon. Keep the conversation uh, going and let's uh, let's keep that that amipotence. It's been now been birthed. Let's keep it growing and flourishing in the go. world. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. All right. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, we'll be back uh, next month with another Theology on Tap conversation. All right.